Hello and welcome to this series of webinars about the early years curriculum with a focus on communication and language. Um, my name is Phil Minns, I'm a senior His Majesty's Inspector and one of the two senior inspectors in um, the curriculum unit, the early education part of the curriculum unit. And I'm joined today by my good friend Sam. Sam, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Phil. I'm Sam Sleeman Boss. I'm an early years regulatory inspector that works in the early education policy team as quality and practice lead. Right, and Sam, I'm, I will be sort of going through this together over for about the next 15 minutes or so. So this is part one in a series of four short webinars um, looking at communication and language. In this first one, we're going to look at why communication and language is so important and how it forms the building blocks of so much learning that comes later on. But firstly, let's consider the different levels of knowledge that young children have. Before children learn how to read and write towards the end of their time in the early years, they typically learn and share what they know through communication and language. It's through the spoken word, through listening and speaking. Communication and language are vital as well for their social and emotional development. We've said before, it's very difficult to distinguish between very early attachments that children make with um, adults and their parents and their carers, and actually the early communication and language that they do when they're learning how to, to um, create those sort of back and forward conversations. So, this early communication and language also helps children to build relationships with peers and adults around them. And then, of course, later on, helps them to talk about worries or what makes them happy. They're able to learn how to express their needs. So communication and language is critical in all aspects of learning. However, there is a really wide variation in children's exposure to language when they get into the early years. Some children will come into the earlier settings from homes where there's lots of conversation and book sharing, and others will come with less developed language and communication. So what does that mean for those children who do enter with less language knowledge than their peers? Well, it's a really important thing for us to consider, Sam, because without action to tackle it, that gap simply grows. Um, you know, this, basically it's the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Research has shown that the gap between those who are word rich and those who are word poor correlates with lasting socioeconomic and health inequalities. Children with a language deficit by the age of five are six times more likely to have literacy difficulties by the age of 11 and twice as likely to be unemployed by the time they're 34. Now we know that early education is really important and sometimes we need to you know, think about this, this research and these numbers to help us remember why it is so important. It's why the education a child receives in the early years is essential ensuring that they develop the communication and language they need. And it should be doing that regardless of their knowledge on entry. Practitioners need to know what children know, understand and can do, but then they need to still have the same ambition for them to reach those places where they leave the early years, having the skills they need to go on to become you know, strong readers eventually. And that's the ambition for all. And they need to be ambitious especially for those children from disadvantaged backgrounds because they need more help to develop their communication and language. Um, we're going to explore the curriculum communication and language in more detail in the second part of these, the second webinar. But for now, let's look at one way that children learn new language from examples. So I'm going to demonstrate how we learn new things through examples from the youngest age onwards. And we'll do this by learning a Cherokee word together. And Cherokee is an endangered language and the native language of the Cherokee people from North America. So imagine that you're a very young child learning the basics of the world around you. And you're told that this is giga gay. And you're told that this is not giga gay. You were told that this is not giga gay. You're told that this is giga gay. And this is giga gay. But this is not giga gay. And finally, you're told that this is giga gay. Have you worked it out? What is giga gay? If we were in a room full of people, we'd be asking them to put their hands up. And I'm sure that everyone has worked out that Giga Gay is red. And of course, what happens as you go through these examples is you begin, you might have thought when you saw that first red apple, 
that it, that Giga Gay was red, but you might equally have thought that it meant apple or food or sweet or round or sphere or something. You would have been equally right because you didn't have enough information. It's only as you go through these examples that you refine your understanding. You basically practice your understanding by hearing this word in a context. So each time you hear it, you get a little bit more sure in what you think it means and you refine that understanding. Usually when people watch this, when they see the red dragon, they feel that they think they know what Giga Gay means. But it's actually only when you get onto this last picture, this, this flower, and that's when you can really be confident that you know that this means red. And it's that certainty which is the advantage for those children who've heard many words many times because they know what words mean. They don't have to think about it. They're just doing, they have that knowledge with automaticity. So when somebody asks them to put the red pencil into the box, they're thinking about where the box is. They're not having to think about that first and earlier piece of information. Whereas if they're uncertain about what red is, or what in this case Giga means, they could be looking at a number of pencils thinking, which pencil is it? So we really need children to have this fluency, this confident, quick knowledge, which comes about from seeing these repeated examples um, and practicing their understanding. And this is why, as it says on this slide, vocabulary is so important. Um, your vocabulary reflects what you know about the world and a good vocabulary allows you to communicate effectively. Research is really clear that vocabulary size is a convenient proxy for a whole range of educational attainment abilities, not just your skills in reading, writing, listening and speaking, but in also in general knowledge of science, history and the arts. That's why you, you could say that knowing more words makes you smarter. And children need the words to describe their thoughts and feelings and to make sense of the world around them. So, Phil, why is learning new vocabulary so important at such a young age? Well, it's, we all know how important the early years are, but sometimes we don't really pinpoint what it is that is that, that is so key in that time. And we know that young children are especially receptive between birth and five when their brains develop at the faster speed and they learn more rapidly than at any other age. Children learn from the actions and words of those around them and they gain the knowledge they need to interact with others. And this opportunity to hear words over and over again means that it helps them to understand what they mean and then to learn how to use them. Now, when we've got very young babies, the first things they're learning about communication and language are probably through facial expressions and gestures. You know, they're learning about back and forwards interactions. And that eventually leads on to conversations where they'll start to use their spoken language, whether that's one word or they'll start to put two words together. If we really want to give children the opportunity to succeed, then the curriculum is vital. You know, knowledge of language from the areas of learning that they cover, and access to a wide range of books, songs, rhymes, poems, those are the things that will really help children to develop their vocabulary. But the rate at which children um, develop their language depends on the quality and the quantity of interactions they've had with adults. So those, when we go back and we think about the difference in the number of words that children have experienced by the time they get into the early years, that's about this quality and quantity of interactions they've had with adults. So those children who arrive in the setting knowing and understanding more words have gained that knowledge because of the quantity and quality of chat and conversations they've experienced up until that point. They're not more intelligent than other children, they've just benefited from some advantages that other children haven't had. They come in with a lot of advantages and the other children need to have those same advantages. And how will early year settings support these children, Phil? Well, that's the, the thing is about trying to make the difference and, and recognise that, as I just said, they're not less intelligent than other children, they just haven't had the same advantages. They hasn't and they haven't been as lucky as other children. So when settings are trying to support those places, if they're going to make a difference for those children who don't have the same vocabulary, they need to find out who they are. They need to know whether those children are quiet because they don't like talking in large groups or if they're quiet because actually they don't have the knowledge and the vocabulary they need to really communicate confidently. And then those children need to get as many opportunities as possible 
to develop their spoken language. They need to get lots of chances to chat about the things that they're doing, seeing and hearing in front of them. Sam, you'll know that um, we did some, some research, some education recovery research following COVID. Um, what have we found out about from, from that research? So providers shared with us that they're particularly concerned that children are behind in the prime areas of learning. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that children born at the beginning of the first lockdown will have recently had their third birthdays. There was some indication that the language and communication skills of children born during the pandemic weren't as strong as those born pre-pandemic at the same age. And providers told us that some babies struggled to respond to basic facial expressions, which might have been due to reduced contact and interaction with others during the pandemic. If we think about it, many children in the early years now, those children who have recently turned three, they'll have been surrounded by adults wearing masks for much of their early lives and therefore were unable to see those lip movements or mouth shapes as regularly. There are ongoing delays in children's speech and language development, which could be due to them having missed out on hearing stories, singing, having conversations that you've already described, Phil. Providers saying that they noticed that some children had limited vocabulary or lacked the confidence to speak and had started to speak in accents and voices that resembled the material that they watched during the pandemic. And that delays to children's speech and language development led them to not socialising with other children as readily as they would have expected previously. We also know that children needing additional support have had to wait longer for external services such as speech and language therapists. And what about the other prime areas? Have they been affected? So we know from our own inspections and from what providers, staff and parents are telling us that the lockdowns, the restrictions, the reduced socialisation, um, for example, the availability of parent and toddler groups really resulted in these children having a lack of interaction beyond their close family. And as a result of that, some of the youngest children have really struggled with their social skills to settle with unfamiliar people and some are shyer, they're quieter and some feel overwhelmed in larger groups. Some children lack the confidence um, and, and are more shy in their settings, such as when they're taking part in those group activities and their social and friendship building skills have been affected and they need more support with sharing and turn taking. Providers reported that regression in children's independence and um, their self-care skills, for example, the children needing help putting on their coats, blowing their nose, fewer children having learned to use a toilet independently. And they said there also continues to be an impact on children's physical development, such as delays in babies learning to crawl and walk. And we know that there have been concerns also from the government about childhood obesity and dental health. But we must remember as well, I think, that for some children, the pandemic might have had a positive impact. Perhaps they had lots of quality time in their families with lots of talk and stories. Yeah, thank you for that, Sam. So that sort of brings us to the end of part one, um, which has given us a summary of the importance of communication and language, as well as that last information that Sam was sharing with you about the impact of the pandemic on some children. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the curriculum for communication and language, then you might find it helpful to listen to part two. But um, we'll leave you for now and um, very much hope you enjoyed it. And thanks, Sam. Thank you. And thank you all very much for, for listening to us. Thanks then. Goodbye. <laughs>